My name is Rob Mel Watley, and I'm the founder and host of the Truck and Hustle podcast. And I'm inviting you to our second annual Freight Fest conference on September 28th through October 1st at the Hilton Americas in Houston, Texas. We understand the transportation and logistics industry has been tough over the past year, but many experts say we've reached the bottom. And as things begin to turn around, you have to have a plan and a strategy to execute for the upcoming year. We've got you. Freight Fest 2023 is here. Let's go. All right, Hustle Fam, Hustle Fam, we are back with another amazing episode. We are in, Az- Azu- how do I pronounce this place? Azuka, Azusa. California? Azusa. Azusa, California. I am here with the legend himself, Mr. Jin. Now, now you, were tra- you were pronouncing my name. Let me make sure I got yours right, right? So it's Qualkenbush. Yes, sir. Is that, did I, is, did I nail it? or You, you nailed it. Now, Ra- Ra- yours is Ra- Ramel. Not like Ramen. Ra- Ramel. Like ramen. Yeah, ramen. Oh, that's how we, I got it. We practiced this already. Okay, we got it. Okay, I got it. <laughs> good? We, we good? good? We're good. All right, all right, all right. So, uh, man, 40, 40 years in towing and recovery. Is is that accurate? 40 uh, years? 40 something, I think. 40 something? What is it? 44 or 5? Almost 50? Yeah, we're getting there. Almost five decades yeah. in this industry. Having fun. One of the leaders in this industry, if not the leader in this industry. Is that safe yes, to sir. say? All right. Yeah. So um, we're going to learn about this business today. I'm super excited to be here. We are, um, it's, we've been having fun, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> we've been having some fun with Jan huh? and just learning about the business. Uh, you know, Jan, just, but, you know, we're going to get into the show, but introduce yourself to the Truck and Hustle audience, your, your name, tell them who you are, and tell them a little bit about Jan's towing, and then we'll get into the interview. All right. Hi, I'm Jan Quackenbush. I'm honored to be on the program. Uh, we're cutting it up, having a great time here. Uh, behind the scenes, I wish you could see behind the scenes as much as <laughs> <That's right. laughs> live. I mean, we're having a blast. We are. We um, are. But anyhow, I, I've we do it all here. We're I consider ourselves a full service company. A lot of companies uh, maybe just tow for an auto club or this or that. I was born in the day where you uh, would pay a little more for fuel, but a man would wash your windshield, check your tires, uh, check your oil if you needed oil, need a quart of oil, you know, show you on your dipstick, put a quart of oil in, and. Um, of course, I'm old. I'm 65, and a lot of people can't relate to that. But anyhow, I like to run a full-service business. <clears throat> and what I've done over the years, police agencies, automobile clubs, the motoring public, whatever the need might be, I'd listen. And I'd go out and purchase whatever I need to purchase to make things happen the right way. A lot of the times, it's investigations. Uh, I love doing investigative work, helping the police. Um, whether it's a mountain recovery or numerous things, there's too many things uh, to talk about. <laughs> really, when it comes down to it. But uh, but anyway, that's just a little backdrop. Yeah, We're just full service. We have battery vans. We have rotators that are upwards of a million dollars. Uh, y- you name it, from a tire change to do private party impounds. If a local store has a problem with uh, parkers or whatever, we help them. Uh, mitigate the situation. Hopefully our signs work. We don't really like to tow uh, those type of vehicles, but if we have to, we will. Um, but anyhow. Okay. I mean, All little... right. Now that's that's great, man. I mean, listen, you've been in business for 40 years. It's very difficult to wrap up 40 years into an hour podcast, but I'm going to do my best to kind of keep the story going and just understand where you where you came from and how you got here, right? Because that's what this is all about, just telling your story. Hustle fam, as you know, we love telling the stories of professionals from all over the transportation and logistics industry. Telling your story helps viewers relate to your plight and also gain inspiration from your triumphs. Telling your story is just as important in a job interview. We've partnered with Indeed, who has a great collection of videos to guide you through that process and help you land a job. One of their videos actually goes in depth about how to tell your story during a job interview. Check out this clip. Hey, my name is Avery. It's nice to meet you. Every single one of us has been asked to introduce ourselves during an interview. It sounds like a question you might ask a new friend, but your potential employer is not looking for your life story. Since this is typically one of the first questions asked in an interview, your response is your first impression. So during your interview prep, it's worth thinking about what you want to say and how you want to say it. I'm going to walk you through a few examples. Let's get started. So, 
Thank you for coming in today. As you can see, a job interview is not a truck and hustle interview. They don't need to hear your life story. They only need to hear about you as it relates to the position that you're applying for. Thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this segment. Make sure you go visit the link in the description and find all the helpful visual resources that Indeed has to offer. And now let's get back to the show. Um, so let's start at the beginning, man. Um, where were you born? So um, tell me about growing up. Glendora, uh, California. And Glendora is like a little bit of a Mayberry town. We've all watched Opie and Andy and Aunt B and everything. And uh, I was the young guy that had the Schwinn bike and the skateboard and uh, would go to the local park, play caroms, and just hang out. Okay. Lay back on the grass and under an oak tree and just really take it in and enjoy life. You were chilling. You were hanging out. I'd chill. And mom would make me a little, a little lunch or... If I was lucky enough, I'd go down to the five and dime and malt shop and get a malt or get a cheese grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> got it. Got yeah. it. How were you in high school? What kind of kid were you? I was kind of a little bit of a class clown, not a troublemaker. I couldn't see that. I yeah. <laughs> I would <laughs> I would I would always stand up for friends, uh, people with, with disabilities or whatever. I, I, I always seem to do the right thing and help people. If people were getting bullied or something, I'd go over and help them out a little bit, and uh, in turn, they'd help me out, help me pass tests and stuff like that. It was it was amazing. <laughs> Some of those people, their IQs. I'd hang out in the library, and what are you hanging out with? That that person, oh, nicest gal in the world. But Jan, come on, hey, I'm I went from D's to A's. That's right. You it's know, the system. It, 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 yeah. It, so she helps me. She tutors me. You know, and that gentleman over there tutors me and. Uh, so they helped me a lot in school. So uh, just being a humanitarian and giving back and not judging people, not being judgmental about anybody. Just, yeah, yeah. just take it for what it is, you know, just deal with it. And uh, beautiful beauty for me always came from the person inside. Got it. I never took, I never looked at the person's look, their race, or anything. Never looked at that. I, I just looked at the, the beautiful person inside while I talked to them. Gave them a little interview, you know. Um, Working class family. Tell me about you. Yeah, my dad was a real estate broker. Okay. And my mom, when she was young, she worked in a mustard factory, made a nickel an hour working uh, in Chicago. And back then, in that day, before my dad became a real estate agent, he actually had a hot dog stand uh, in Chicago, and they had a line of cars and buses and the police. Everybody'd wait in that hot dog line and get a kosher hot dog. Mm. And um, I don't recall that much about it because I don't even think I was born yet, but I, I just hear the stories. <laughs> you hear the stories. And they're wonderful stories. That's right. You know, the hot dog stand. My dad loved to cook and my mom loved to cook. And so. Uh, Got it. You graduate high school. What do you do next? Or did um, you graduate high school? Absolutely. I don't want to assume. Oh, no. I okay. graduated high school and I, I did okay. Okay. I, I went to Citrus College over here, took some local uh, body and fender courses great teachers over there um i was always kind of a blue collar kid uh i traded bought and sold uh just hustled to make a buck you know Got i'd it. go to swap meets i would uh, one time in my life i had four jobs i just never stopped uh i just had a lot of energy and i wanted to learn and the funny thing about me is i was honored if somebody wanted me to work for them mm. i didn't i didn't even ask them how much i was getting paid <laughs> I, I just knew i had a job and then when i had two jobs three jobs, four jobs, I'm like, wow, this is great. And I showed up to all of them. And uh, after college, I, I did good. Uh, you know, I was a body and fender man for quite a few years and traded off and I got a tow truck right after that. Okay. You want me to get into that a little bit? No, of course I do. Yeah. So you got right into business. Got into college. business. What'd you, what'd you study in college? Well, body shop, body fender, body and fender work, okay. metal, metal finish. Got I didn't, it. I didn't use Bondo back then. I, I, I learned how to use a peck and file and lead, and I learned it the hard way. You, know, you see a lot of custom lead sleds and all these custom cars and stuff. People would send me fenders and bumpers and tanks and everything, and I uh, motorcycle tanks, and I would metal finish and make them perfect and hammer weld and do all kinds of stuff. And so I liked working with my hands, a blue-collar guy. and uh, But then that got a little tedious. It was, it was too slow for the money to come in. Um, Pick and file and making all that stuff perfect took a lot of time, like painting a Rembrandt, right? I just didn't have time for that. I wanted to move quicker. Mm. So I decided from going from that type of body work to working at Earl Scheib. Okay. What's that? 
it's a $29.95 paint job, the cheapest paint job around. They advertise. And it was it's a good little company. They're still in business today. And uh, and I'd line up four cars, and then I started using body filler. And look out. That's when the bonuses came in. That's where I made some real big money. And I knew how to make things look just right. And I knew how to do it somewhat right, where people were totally happy. Mm. They were throwing me tip money. And and then my, my manager at the time was... He was saying, I don't know what you're doing, but don't stop. This is incredible. And then the painter didn't show up one day, and I'm painting 10 cars a day. And uh, so I just learned, you know, how to how to do things, how to, how to make money efficiently and yeah. make make bonus money and uh, all that, you know. Got it. And then when did you buy the truck? Well, back when I, in between, I had a little body shop mm-hmm. that we rented, and, and I was doing side work. Okay moonlighting a little bit from my job, you know, and everybody does that. And, uh, and the body shop grew into a hobby shop. I restored classics. Um, and, uh, then I traded, I horse traded and somehow I ended up with a, uh, a truck, uh, a tow truck. I traded a couple cars and, and it was an old 67 or 68 Chevy tow truck with a West boom on it. And it was a sling truck. Okay. I didn't know how to use a tow truck, but by, <laughs> but backing up on the story just a little bit, I had an uncle back in Chicago, and he owned a company called Speedy's Towing in Lombard, Illinois. Okay. And when I was a little boy, I used to walk around his house. I used to beg to go to see Uncle Robert and see his beautiful tow trucks, and it'd be snowing out, and those two big old tow trucks would be there. And it did something for me to look up at those tow trucks and see my Uncle Robert. And then he'd be smoking a cigar or whatever. And my aunt Jean would be, she, Marcy, I think aunt Marcy at the time, she'd be uh, dispatching. Okay. And he'd tell me, Hey, Jan, I got to leave. I, you know, I, nice seeing you. I'll be back in a little bit. I got to go tow a truck. And so uh, he'd watch, I'd watch him pull out. And then I just said, wow, I want to do that. He planted the seed. He planted a seed. Yeah. And from that point on, I wanted a tow truck. So I horse traded, got a tow truck, learned how to use that tow truck. Had several pe- people help me, train me how to use a tow truck efficiently. And uh, and from that point, once I learned it, it was like contagious. I, I caught this will to work and I would have my friends call me because they knew I had a tow truck. They'd say, hey, I had a few too many. Can you pick me up, tow me home? And of course, back then we didn't have Uber. We didn't have Lyft. <laughs> we didn't know that stuff. For sure. So I'd, I'd help give everybody helping hand and the local tire center bob odell i remember he gave me one of my first starts bless his heart wonderful man he uh called me up says hey i see you got a tow truck out by the house there one of my mechanics made a little error you mind towing it back for me and i, I said absolutely bob i'll go to pick it up i didn't have names on my truck or nothing i went out there hooked it up really quick got it to a shop he says man you did that like a pro and i said well i tow a lot of my cars around i've learned you know and uh he says, hey, what would you charge me to do this? You know, company we have here doesn't do a real good job. They don't respond properly. And I said, oh, Bob, I don't know. I'll just, let's just work it out. Let's just see how things go and pay me what you think it's worth and I'll help you out. So one thing led to another. And before you knew it, that truck never shut off. <laughs> <laughs> <Matter>. <laughs> just kept on going. Kept, huh? kept going. Yeah. And a, a cute story about that old truck. It ran really good and everything. We lettered it up. And I called Jan's towing on it and everything. But that truck... It would use a, a pint of gear oil from here to San Diego. It had a pinion seal on the back leak, and, and I could never shut it down long enough to put a pinion seal and remove <laughs> the drive shaft to get it go, keep it going. <laughs> right. So I had to get underneath there and just pull the drain the plug and put oil in it and keep her going. Yeah. yeah. So, but those are things you remember. Yeah, for sure. You know, for it, sure. It, it, things have sure changed. You know, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Okay. So that's your humble beginnings. You just, you're, you're just getting started. What year is this? Just to like, if we could put a, a date on that. Uh, 79, you, 80. 79, 80. What's the tow truck industry like at this time? It is a fantasy for me. I, I absolutely love doing what I do. Um, I, I dreamed about living the way I'm living right now. It was a dream. And uh, do you mind if I have him grab a picture? Yeah, no, good. Hey, get the picture off the wall in there about the spaceships flying around the world up there. Yeah. I, I'll show you how I would dream and create a vision. Back in the day, um, I, I would sit at a bar and have a, a drink with people. And I'd tell them, you know, 
what I thought about the industry, where it's going, about spaceships and about space junk and satellites and everything. And, and these are a couple. If, if you'd like to show those, uh, yeah, yeah, hold them up sure. and take a look at those. Oh, yeah. Th these are my vision way back when. And now we got Mr. Musk uh, <laughs> with all the SpaceX stuff and everything. Yeah. These are over 20 years old. And so that one there says towing into the future. Really? So, yeah. These are 20 and, years old. Yeah. And, and you see that see right that? there? It's got the Hawaiian Islands there and Maui and all that down below. Um, and these these are Peterbilt trucks. And they're they're hooked made into a jet, and so I fantasized about like this guy right here hooking up a satellite, that space guy that's got jams on it right there, mm. and that's a satellite hooking it up and towing it. Okay. So I visioned, I was a visionary. I visioned on this happening, and it's happening now. And in some of the towing magazines, we've seen how they've actually got a device that clamps onto satellites. Yeah. And I don't know if they keep in a magnetic orbit or what for a junkyard up in the sky. But it's all things that I fantasized and dreamt about are coming true now. And right. so sometimes I have to pinch myself. I'm like, yeah, like whoa. So it, it, was, it's, it seems like this, is, this was truly your passion. Like you love this industry. I, I loved it. I, I did everything I could from making, uh, working with, uh, there's gentlemen market tow industries and we've got some people at uh, VTTR. We got Eddie and Johnny and just, just some people that have been instrumental in my life. Um, and we got some people down in uh, Orange County down there too, uh, SoCal Record Service, and uh, just, just several. Uh, Troy over at the, uh, I'm trying to think of his the company over there, but they've all helped me and yeah, worked yeah, and yeah. supported me. Got it. Not one of them ever turned me down with my crazy ideas. <laughs> and, and so I wanted special toolboxes on the sides of the truck. So if you ever see these big, long toolboxes on the sides of the trucks, I had one of the first ones uh, with these long boxes, and they called it a Jan Spec truck. And everybody wanted, when they saw these lights that are all lit up and the underglow flashing, I just wanted to be people be safe and uh, and be able to put all your tools away and everything and lock things up. And the biggest thing is, you know, you see all these big rigs out there with all the fender skirts. I wanted to have something in a toolbox to where if somebody hits you in a motorcycle or a bicycle or something, it didn't go underneath. You kind of, they bounced off the side, if that makes any sense. They mm -hmm. didn't get caught under a rear wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I built these with safety in mind, the boxes and everything, yeah. and designed them. Keep people away from the tires and wheels, because that's how you get hurt. Um, so, you know, lighting. I, I've Some people say, well, you shouldn't have too much lighting. I, I don't think you can have enough. I, I started putting off-road lights <laughs> on the back of trucks, you know, the big off-road lights. Yeah, yeah. I, I started putting those there. Got it. And at these everybody's saying, what the heck? We normally use these little round or square little lights. And I said, oh no. I go up in the mountains and retrieve vehicles. When I have a flatbed going up to pick one up on the side or a berm or something, I want him to flip a light and let there be light. That's you know, right. I, I That's light right. Light everything. it up. Light up the sky. And so we've even put some running lights down down in the front of some of the trucks that work the mountain. It's all about safety. Yeah. Seeing where you're going, you know. I got it. So when do you start to understand that you have a business here? Because I know you got started from passion, right? And you probably were just doing what you were doing. This is the 80s. When do you start really getting serious about the business side of, of towing? I, I guess when people really start to rely on you. That t tire store or the lady that's broke down at the local market. And she's got her ice cream and her her vegetables and her pastries and all that stuff in her in the in the bags and they and you just see that and you you know that she's in a desperate situation because the ice cream is melting. So you just say, hey, "Don't worry, ma'am. We're, we're going to take care of this right now. Um, let me get your car loaded up. We're going to get you. I'm going to take you to your house. I'm going to help you unload your groceries. And and then." And then from that, after we unload the groceries, I'll take your car to whatever repair shop you want. And, and then, uh, well, if you need me to take you to get a rental car, we'll get your rental car. So when I, and, and maybe, let's say the husband was deceased or maybe on vacation or whatever, but I took care of this person, um, treated him like a, a real good human being. It was a service I provided. Yeah. And I just felt, it wasn't about the money. I, I didn't care and I didn't have the, the meter running. It was just, <laughs> it was just, you know, let's take care of those groceries. Let's get her to where, and then she's, I got to, I got to be at the doctor or I got to pick up the kids or I got to, don't worry, we got a handle on it. Yeah. I'd call up Enterprise and I'd say, hey, we need a rental car for this lady. You know, do you have a van? She's got a van. Do you have an SUV? What do you have? And so we'd get her set up, take her down, introduce her to somebody at the local car rental place, get them in a car. And, and whether it's an accident they're in 
just things happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you facilitate that need. You figure out how to fill that void. You don't make it worse. That's right. You know? That's right. No, I got it. But you, you you still have one truck at this time, right? It's just because I'm still taking it back to the origins of Jan. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's that's so, it. So still one, one truck. truck. You're, you're helping people out. You yep. you're figuring. You're adding value where you can. Just pretty much just because you don't because you don't see this yet. Maybe you see it, but you don't like it's not here yet. It's just right. the beginning. So you're doing a lot of things that maybe aren't the best for your business. Yeah. But the, you're just doing it because you're the, the biggest thing. I think it is is common sense. Mm -hmm. You know. How do we how do we fix this with common sense? And, and that was the biggest thing. The common de denominator is common sense. So anyhow, um, I, I think by doing that and by just fixing the problem, you see these people are in dire need and they need help. Yeah, I got just it. Help them. I got it. Let's fix the problem. And then so that it grew. Then I needed help. I, so I hired a couple guys. Then I bought a flatbed. And when I got the first flatbed around the local area, wow, that was a big thing. Then all the Corvettes and all that kind of stuff, all the custom hot rods, and they felt, you know, that they didn't need a trailer things. They they could, you know, they could uh, uh, facilitate that flatbed, which worked out wonderful. And I really took off after the flatbed. After the flatbed. And yeah. So so were people finding you, or were you marketing your services at this time? Um, word of mouth. Word of mouth. They were finding me. They they saw the trucks, they saw everything, and they were they would find me, and uh, they'd find my number. And, and at the time, we we're using our household number, and uh, that's how they that's how they found me. And my mom would dispatch for me because I'd be so busy during the day, I couldn't answer the phone. I couldn't. I'd be out doing toes, and I, I don't even think back then they didn't even have pagers back then, and so you had to phone in. You know, they didn't have detachable phones. They didn't have cell phones. We're we're we had dial phones right and you're lucky if you had a long extension cord you know i mean it, it, it just or carry it around the house yeah you know normally they were fixed to a wall or something you know or on a on a table for sure so uh so the the beginnings were very humbling yeah, yeah so now you know you see the lighting here behind me and tools and this is fantasy land for me yeah i yeah, love yeah. living it i i love shopping i love putting stuff together uh making our employees making it easier for them to facilitate the need to the public yeah. and to the police, everybody, you know, clubs, whatever. For sure. Making sure that your compliance is on point is an integral part of any trucking related business. Today, I stopped by my friends over at Fleet Drive 360 to talk about what they're building to make sure that you can run a successful trucking company. And it's everything from the minute you decide you want to hire somebody through maintaining all of your FMCSA compliance documents for ongoing fleet or, or owner operator truck uh, business. You've got a driver hiring and recruiting module where you'll create driver qualification files, import digital documents. You've got a drug and alcohol module where you can schedule pre-employment drug tests and manage an ongoing testing pool. We've got an accident registry so you can keep your mandated accident logs and even schedule follow-up uh, drug testing for post-crash. We've got vehicle maintenance logs so you can not only maintain the compliance status of your vehicles but also upload your work orders and compliance related documents so you're audit ready when they come in. We've got a document repository, fancy words for digital cloud storage of any document that you want, not just necessarily the compliance documents, anything related to your business, post crash videos, performance evaluations. And then finally, you've got the dashboard and the dashboard is the most important part. You can close your eyes and glance at our dashboard, open them, glance at the dashboard and immediately know whether or not you're compliant or not, both on a driver, company and vehicle level. It's one stop shop for all your compliance needs. A little bit of credit at the time, $20,000 or $30,000 for a truck maybe. All of a sudden you got a credit line and this guy says, whatever you need, go buy it. Don't worry about it. You know, you, you got a half million dollar credit line. I said, really? Said, yeah, you're trustworthy. Don't worry, I trust you. You're not going anywhere. And we this use is the in what year? Oh, 83, 4, something like that. Wow. And, and, and at some point, he's just told me, he just said, We got the trucks for collateral. Don't worry. We, you know, got it. We're good. We'll take them back if we'll you take can't them back. Pay, you don't make it. Because I was worried. I said, What happens? So then from that, it just grew. And all of a sudden, you got a million dollar credit line. You're buying better trucks, bigger trucks. I, at, at first, too, I did put some a lot of stuff on credit cards. Because, you know, you just don't have that kind of money. You're working a lot of jobs. You're 
you know, I, I worked at Miller High Life as a part-time bottler. I I worked as a bar, part-time bartender. While you were towing. While I'm towing. Yeah. Had the tow truck standing by. And uh, then I worked at the swap meets, going back and forth selling merchandise. I mean, I, I started off with nothing. I, I would pick out uh, things out of people's trash cans and, uh, and clean them up, fix them, you know, tables, chairs, whatever that were still usable. And I'd fix them and I'd sell them at the swap meet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd refinish, do all that. So I learned skills by doing the goodwill type stuff, right? Yeah. And, and, and I felt it interesting. I felt it fun. I never let grass grow under my feet. I always worked. I never stopped. If I didn't work, I, I didn't feel like I accomplished anything that day. I wanted to rest my head on the pillow and figure out what I did that day. And how I, you know, was, how would you say, paving the future for my life. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to just sit back in a bar, sit back and not do anything and, and just hang out with a lot of friends. I, I cherished my friends' relationships, but I just didn't want to waste my time just chit-chatting. I, I wanted to be productive and I wanted to help people. Yeah. So I think that set me apart when my friends would call me on a Friday night. Hey, Jan, we're, and I can't make it. I'm doing this or I'm doing that or I'm on call or I'm bartending <laughs> or I'm taking a truck to, you know, down there on a right. tow truck. Busy. I'm, I'm busy. I I didn't have time for the small talk. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. And, and and you said you start get you said you start needing some help. So you start yep. getting some other guys. Yep. Where do you find these guys? You do high oh, you just high school friends, friends buddies. Yeah. Great guys. Okay. You know, just good solid people that never uh, cheated you in the lunch line. Because <laughs> all that stuff, you know, I, I look at their families, I look at them, you know, when I choose somebody for a friend. And if somebody wasn't doing the right thing, I didn't necessarily hang out with them. I might, I might hang out with them a little bit to pick their brain to find out how to stay out of trouble. Because mm. I really wasn't streetwise, you know, I mean, I just worked. So you, uh, you learn in different ways. Yeah, yeah, got it. All right, so you start to, to grow the company. What becomes your first initial niche that really starts to take you to, um, starts to give you the most growth? Like what, what, was, uh, what was that inflection point that you started like really get into your, 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 your zone well, as a business person? That's that, what I'm that's trying a, to that's understand. That's a great question. Uh, and I've got the perfect answer for it. I, <laughs> in my tow truck, I would uh, have a plastic bag and I would have a suit and tie. And I would, I'd wear my, uh, during the normal job running the tow truck, I'd wear my, official, you know, uh, Dickies or whatever. And I, I belong to the Chamber of Commerce. And so uh, I worked up from being an ambassador in the chamber, getting new members and everything uh, to where I, I ended up being first vice president in the Glendora Chamber of Commerce. And that gave me a lot of purpose. And, and the funny thing was uh, they'd call me and they'd have a scheduled meeting or whatever. And, and, and I would, um, I would, zip out of my regular clothes, get into a, a suit and tie mm -hmm. and be in a meeting with the mayor, or the chief of police, you know. Uh, yeah, you can grab it. It's cool. Yeah, no problem. Oh, you need my grinder? No. Tony needs a tester. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so a little at a time, I sold a lot of memberships because the memberships were down a little bit in the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. In one, in one year, I set the record for signing people up in the Chamber of Commerce. And the way I did that, it was easy for me because a lot of my accounts, I would go and tell them, hey, if, if, if you sign up at the Chamber, I can have the mayor come over here, some city council members, the, the people that represent the Chamber of Commerce. I will in help introduce you to the city right to all the people here right uh, and and so i did i held my word to everybody so we'd have ribbon cuttings we would have uh mixers and and it was just so cool to watch these other businesses prosper and to help them it wasn't about just me it was about us and i knew if i helped them they would help me in return it just came that way and so then i just kept helping them more and that's how jan's towing just grew because uh, I, I did so much to help community and volunteerism and all that. Uh, whatever, the hundred, Glendora's 100th birthday, I was a chairperson for the pancake breakfast. 
And uh, it was just, it was phenomenal. Uh, one of the best pancake breakfasts you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. I had everybody donate, everything. It was phenomenal. Um, but those are good memories. And, and all those businesses showed up, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how businesses grow, by being involved. And you just can't be a taker. Right. You got to be a giver. 100%. And, and the more you give, the more just, it just, come, it'll just come your way by hard work. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Give me an uh, idea of uh, the like your fleet size and just to, so, so people could understand what the business looks like today. If, if you know it off the top of your we, head. We're approximately we're just shy of 50 trucks. That's including service vans. We got military, you know, six wheel drive units that are we had rotators around before anybody even uh, knew about a rotator. The military rotators are off road. And those facilitated a big need for mountain recoveries, going off road and doing things that nobody ever <laughs> saw the need. You know, yeah. uh, they laughed at me when I got one. Then they didn't laugh very long after they saw it work. <laughs> Had a pretty That's strong right. winch on the back of it, and it could do the incredible. There were so many cars up in the mountains nobody could get. So one of my projects in life was to figure out how to get those cars off the mountain because search and mountain rescue i felt bad for them they were getting called up sometimes on the same car because hikers uh fishermen they, they'd see a, a glare off a windshield and they say oh there's a car down there so uh they'd keep calling on the same car and then they started barking them with an x or whatever you know bright x um, so what i did i worked with the forestry uh, search and mountain rescue and the sheriff's department and i helped uh, free of charge to get all the cars from mount baldy all the way, did some in Highway 2, Highway 39, Glenora Mountain Road, Ridge Road, East Fork, West Fork, wherever there was cars over the side that were, they were deemed at the time unrecoverable. And I'd talk to the state, you know, and uh, county, and I'd say, really? They're saying that's unrecoverable? For me, it didn't look like anything. You know, I, I'd i figure it out and rappel down there and say, I can get that up. So all of a sudden, I, I became the go-to guy for all the mountaineering stuff to get the cars up. So it saved the county, the state, a lot of money, saved all these volunteers that belong to the Search and Mountain Rescue, a lot of exhausting trips away from their work or whatever, because they have to respond, they have to drop what they're doing and go up there yeah. and check it out and go, go up to the same car four or five times until enough brush goes over it where nobody sees it. <laughs> oh, you know? God. So, and then uh, fire seasons, all that, there'd be a lot of cars undercover. We'd pull up cars and where are uh, these cars coming from? They're, they're just like going people over get they push them over uh, insurance jobs. They were actually some people were missing people that we found cars and we found the people, unfortunately. Oh, wow. And so, you know, some not so good stories. Um, but it, it was it was really something doing that. And, and in my heart, I feel like I've always done the right thing by cleaning the mountain and helping uh, the forestry and the sheriffs and everybody uh, just getting those cars up uh, because you don't want them leaking. You don't want them uh creating more forest fires uh different things because a glass can start a forest fire you know yeah. but aiming a, like a magnifying glass you don't want that that's right so by getting all that stuff up it's just a good humanitarian act you see people up with trash bags and all that kind of stuff cleaning the mountainside so my job was picking the cars up was anybody else doing that at the time no or, so no. you kind of innovated they, that and found they, that niche to help that they were the guys that need. couldn't get them up they Got just it. couldn't get them up over the side and i figured facilitated a way to do it and that phone started ringing off the hook. That's smart. And now we're still doing it. And we have, get a lot of copycats. A lot of people around here do it. And I know in the United States, there's a lot of people that probably did the same way that I, I've done it. I'm, I'm sure there's a few handfuls out there that uh, had mountainous areas and how to do it. I'm not the only one. But around here, I was one of the only ones. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, they say, hey, we got one 1,000 feet over. All of a sudden, people's knees start to knock, you know? <laughs> but not me. I would look at it and say, really? Right. When are we going to get to one 2,000 feet? Let's go. <laughs> so so we can go over as far as we need. We got cable. We just attach the cable together and send repellers down. And the tougher it is, the more I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes you guys stand out and sets you apart from everybody stand up. else. And when we get that car up, people video it and they look at it and they're like, wow. It's just a feel-good thing to be successful uh, at something. And there's been a lot of copycats. A lot of people do it. And they do it well now, but they learn through us, a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. And that's okay. I'm, pr I'm proud of that. That's I'm, a, I'm that proud. That's a beautiful of, thing. It is. And when they've ever asked me questions, I've always tried to help them and, and save them. I don't want to see somebody with a small truck trying to bring a, a big car up from way down and, and have a cable break and 
somebody get killed or something. I'd I'd rather my old saying is I'd rather bring up uh, on, a, on a big old trolling rod uh, like you're supposed to catch a marlin on. I'd rather bring up a little trout on a marlin on a marlin fishing rod than a you know yeah. and, and do it easy right. effortlessly. Right. And so that's what I did. I just used bigger equipment and I get the job done. I don't send a small truck up 30 miles up on the hill up here and say, I sent the wrong truck. That's right. I, I sent a big truck up there. That's no right. matter what, I know I'm going to get it. Any any crazy stories related to that? I'm sure you have plenty, but anyone that comes to mind in, in doing that type of mountain search it, and re- recovery? Yeah, there, there was one gentleman that was missing for many years, and, uh, and, and, and he was uh, a handicapped, challenged person that had remote controls and all that stuff on the car, and and it was heartwarming. We found him just to have closure for the family. Hold we, on. So he was missing for years? Years. Yeah, we found him up on Highway 39. And it was down. They drained the lake. And we found him down in the water in the in the reservoir, I believe. How did he or survive? Near the reservoir. He didn't. Oh, I was going to say because, okay, no, got it. He was, he was But you on. said it was closure for the family. I got you. Yep, right? it was closure for the family. We, yeah. we found his body. Because they didn't know. He was just a missing person. They, were still, they still had hope. But sometimes when you can have closure... Uh, it, it's a big thing for the families. Yeah. At least they know what no, happened. No, for sure. A hundred percent. So. A hundred percent. Wow. That, and I'm sure you see a lot of different things like that. Um, Terrible. Yeah. Just Absolute all types of things that you tragic, see. Tragedies up there. Constant. And we that's how we got the Irwindale Speedway uh, going. I wanted to get the kids not to drift up there in Ricky Race. So I, uh, at the time, I spoke on behalf of What's the Ricky sheriff. What's Ricky Race? What's that? Uh, Ricky Race going around the corners too fast, you okay. know. and. Screwing around. Yeah, yeah. Being a kid, right? Gotcha, gotcha. And so uh, they were putting in a speedway. They were talking about it. And and so I didn't know how the vote was going. So I went up and spoke and pushed it for several years and stressed my opinion on how the kids go up on the mountain and they, you know, slalom race up there, basically. (laughs) Like you see the drifting and all that. Yeah, yeah. They do that up there. So I wanted to create an environment that they could do right, right here locally. And we did. So they've got drifting boxes. They can do eighth mile racing straight away, or they can go on a roundy round and do uh, enduro racing, whatever they want. Okay. So it's like a, a playground for cars that we've created. And I think we've saved a lot of lives by having that race park over in Irwindale. And Irwindale's known for racing. A lot of great racing families and people and drivers and, you know, a lot of supporters. And it's just a need. So you were involved in actually like building the race park and getting everything together? Yes. Okay. When, when did that yeah. happen? Um, back in 1999. Okay. We uh, sponsored. Uh, they had a large sponsor at the time. And, and this is all about business. Yeah. They had a large sponsor back out at the last minute. And uh, Mr. Jim Williams, wonderful man. Uh, he, he asked me, he, he said, hey, you know, we had the sponsor back out. Do you know anybody that would want to sponsor this? race and it was the inaugural first arca race like a uh you know big race nascar race and yeah. i and i said you know mr williams I, I said i don't have a lot of money but i'd love to do it with my tow company and he and he just looked at me and he said let's do it and so uh that's how the jans towing 250 uh became an effect and from that you've had people like ron hornaday kurt bush they all raced in that race mm. and so uh, for me to have that start and that opportunity to sponsor that race, it was a big thing on that big marquee to have my name out there to, on the tickets had my name. I was like, wow, <laughs> how'd this happen? Right. You right. know, and then it went on. I, I got hooked and I got some NASCARs. I mean, I, I, we race and have some fun how out many, there. How many NASCARs? Yeah. Oh, we got four or five. Four or five. And, yeah. And different types. We, we've got late model cars. We've got enduro cars. We've got ARCA cars. Uh, which are the the big the big ones, the real fast ones? And, how do you, uh, how do you make money with NASCARs? You really don't, but I use it for advertising. Some it's people advertise advertising. in different ways. Okay, and and what I've had the opportunity is to meet so many wonderful race fans that support us, and uh, and I I don't race myself. I used to race a dragster uh, many years ago uh, on a quarter mile out Riverside, Orange County, and all that, and Irwindale, um, but. It, it's just when you support a racetrack, a local racetrack, and support the kids, it comes back to you a million times. Um, and so I, I'm all in supporting and helping uh, the race, local racetracks, get kids off the freeways, hot rod, and then off the mountains. 
Yeah. Get them in a controlled environment where you have safety crews. You know, you, you've got fire, you've got ambulances, you've got, you, you know, if somebody does get hurt, you can take care of them. Yeah, for sure. We are here live at OTR Solutions HQ. I'm here with my partner, Jonathan. Man, listen, factoring is an integral part of the transportation industry. Why is factoring important? Absolutely, Ramel. In this economy, in this market, cash flow is king. Cash flow is the key to growth. If you have a young trucking company or if you've been in the industry for years and you want to take that business to the next level, we're absolutely a company that can help. So I hope you'll give us a call today. Let us know what we can do to help you out. Get the rest and roll with the best. Let's go. In addition to, I mean, that's we just now talked about one niche that you're in, like the mountain search and recovery. What are some of the other niches and specialties that you guys that you guys do? Um, we do a lot of uh, private party impounds. We don't what does tow that mean? a lot. What's uh, a private PPIs party? private party means um, you own a local liquor store and people from the apartment unit park in your. Got it. In your uh, and you, I call you up. I say, "Hey, Jen, we need some help." This guy in my space, come get him. So we tow for so many local communities has a hole. I think we tow approximately for approximately twenty uh, different cities, a county, the state, and everybody. And so by doing that, when people see our name on the signs, they kind of know that hey, we better not do this. So I'd rather give people signs, and I don't charge for them most of the time unless they have special wording or artwork done on them yeah then we have to charge whatever the sign company charge we just pass it on but i'd rather advertise you know do not park here you know right. and make sure they see it rather than tow their cars right and so by having that type of reputation you know six thousand properties i mean that's it's a lot it's a lot it's a full-time job i got a couple of guys full-time that do it and help us out and uh that that do a wonderful job and people call us our phone rings five, six times a day. People want the free sign, and, and we got to do a ten mile limit. <laughs> the free you know, sign. the free signs. Yeah, yeah. They, and, and they want to do it in a nice, kind way. We'll put stickers on the cars. I mean, we do everything we can not to tow them. Yeah, I don't want to tow their car. Yeah. So, so with a private party impound, is that something that you have to set up? Like, how, how do you set something like that up? Is that like how, how does that work to even put that in place? Well, to, to be the to be the 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 tow the company of you know, the, the, the go-to company for that. How does that work? Basically, you, I started off with just a few uh, and then it grew and, and it grew so well. It was, it started off as a deterrent. Okay. Like I was saying, you know, uh, and it grew so well, neighbors, everybody found out about it and the free signs and it, it just grew by itself, actually, so, so, like a weed. So, okay, so tell me about the first one. Like how'd, that, how'd you get that one? How'd that situation happen? I think actually, um, <laughs> somebody had asked me you know to put a sign up and and i think it i think it was at the local market uh -huh. uh, they were having problems with people parking behind the market that lived in a local duplex or something and i said yeah i'll put the signs up and um and i just made up a sign and i figured out the california state codes and put those on there did everything as official as we could yeah and at the time and it just grew and but, all of a sudden now, but, but, now you got big department stores you got everything that want them but the thing is I, I know like when they have that it's like you're you're like the only company that's able to tow that so how do yeah. you get that official like like to where no one else could tow but only you just, that's just have them just have them sign it up on that property okay every property is exclusive yeah and let's say if we didn't do a good job or if they wanted us to tow more stuff and we didn't really feel that we should be towing them they can move on and use somebody else okay it's a free, free enterprise. So it's between thing. you and the owner of whoever. That Absolutely. Is, if they right? like our service, if they like the deterrent, if it's working for them, we're, you know, I don't want to call it like a pest control or anything, but, <laughs> it's, right. but you know, right. it, it's just, it's a deterrent. Yeah. I, I don't want to tow their cars. I just want to make them do the right thing. You know, there's signs every place we go. You got a men's restroom, a ladies restroom. That's the easiest way I can explain it. Just do the right thing. Read the signs right, before right, you right. park. That's right. And most people, they know they're parking. In a, it's not a parking ride. Don't park there and drive and get picked up and drive to L.A. with a, a co-worker or something and just leave your car parked right in the front doors of somebody's stop and go or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. Okay, so the private party in pounds, what else? Yep. We do uh, AAA, Automobile Club of Southern California, run several thousand calls with them. 
Seven thousand a what? Several thousand calls, AAA calls. But uh, is it a month? A month. Okay, that's month. what I was looking and, for. Yep. And uh, they, <laughs> they can they can be from anything from a jump start battery check. We have battery checkers. We uh, diagnose or complete system uh, in a mobile van in, in just a few minutes. Okay. Was it difficult to get a contract with Pit AAA? Um, not really. I, they, How long you very, been with them? Oh, 30-ish, okay. 35, 30, 35 years or very gracious people, very kind people. They just they just want a job done and reasonable price and take care of their members. And we've uh, had numerous awards with the club. Um, the club has been very instrumental um, for everybody. Not only uh, as a customer, I'm a AAA member. I mean, I <laughs> you know, it, it's a great feeling to have that too. card in your wallet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you get in any trouble, they're there. They'll unlock your car, do whatever. Wonderful organization. Yeah. So I, I can't I can't say enough about them. Um, training everything they help us okay in depth got it so got it okay what else um so from AAA, AAA, we got then, the then private then we, uh, pro private party private party and then party. commercial tows just for somebody that doesn't have any type of uh, towing insurance or anything they, they can call us up and we'll tow them to the local repair facility or if they crash we'll take them to the body shop and take care of that and then we also do a, a police towing that's one of our specialties. Mm. Um, our police towing, uh, I think because we're just dependable, I, I don't believe we've ever not shown up at a response uh, on any type of a police call. Uh, we, I've just had a passion uh, for getting to the scene of an accident. I understand if there's a SIG alert, uh, what to do and how, how to get team members up to the freeway or uh, wherever that crash is and just handle business. Um, I, I think that's one thing that's really helped our reputation and where, you know, you mentioned how many trucks I, I have, I, I probably could have had, uh, at this point, 500 trucks out there working with a lot of different locations, uh, like burger chains or whatever that create a great burger. Right. We, we create a great service for what we do, but I, I didn't want to reach outside that realm. You know, I'm, right. I'm happy with what we have and what we're doing and facilitating yeah. The need locally. Is that because you want to keep the quality up? Like quality Quality control? up. And I don't want to stretch myself too thin. Um, f for what we do, we, we do so much. And it's it's pretty stressful because you figure most people get to go home. They work an eight to five job. And over here, we, we don't get to go home. We have three shifts. We work around the clock. We work weekends, work holidays. Um, sometimes there's a Thanksgiving dinner and sometimes there's not. So you have to plan your Christmases. Uh, you have to plan everything and take turns. Yeah, yeah. The police tone, that's the one I've heard is very difficult to to get into. I know a lot of a lot of tow companies don't like the tow companies who have the police contracts. Is there anything you can, can you speak to that at all? Well, it's it's like being a, a great basketball player, you know. He's you're able to hit the hit the <laughs> yeah, you're able to hit the three pointer. Or or like or like hitting the uh a home run all the time, uh, Mike Trout or you know, or, or the judge, or what, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do do their guys that are in the dugout on the opposing team really like those guys? No, not necessarily. They don't. So they don't like me. They don't like excellence. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of a good feeling for them not to like me and yeah. to be jealous, or we it, call it jelly. Jelly, jelly. You know, it's okay. They can be jelly for as sure. long as they learn from me, and I know they've learned from the professor. Because a lot of them call me the professor. You know. And I try to teach them. Yeah. I try to help them with their mistakes and uh, in a kind way, you know, and work together with them. Yeah. The ones that are smart will come to me. For sure. For sure. What, what's the, what's the, for the entrepreneurs out here that's kind of listening and, and interested in this industry, not they're going to compete against you, mm -hmm. but um, what, what is the proper way to kind of set up a tow truck mm -hmm. business? What do you want to think about before you get started? What's important? Land. If inner city land is so hard to get, um, if, you know, it's easier to get land off and away in, in desert areas, remote areas, and to have a little impound yard, um, inner city land is so difficult. Uh, so they, you have to have infrastructure before you really get going. And that infrastructure is for? What's that land for? Impounds, store your trucks, do everything properly. I think then you gain respect from the local community. Um, and sometimes you could buy a competitor out maybe, you know. Um, 
that's that's happened in the past. People buy each other out, whatever, move around, and that they might have a piece of land you need. So you buy them out, they move on, they retire, whatever. Um, so there's a lot of ways to, uh, you know, the towing is a game, basically. Yeah. You so know? the first thing you think about is land. What, what do yeah. you think about next? Um, staff and equipment. And, uh, and the funny thing is, so many people have the misconception of people. Uh, let's say you come in, you want a job. Mm -hmm. and, and we talk and I turn out I really like you as a person. You know, I really like you. He's a good person, good hearted guy. Um, and I ask you some questions. What do you do? Have you been in the military? Have you, you know, and so around in a roundabout way, I figure out what your knowledge base is um, without telling you what I'm doing. And I'll <laughs> even go out and look at your car when I walk you out there. And I'll see what kind of closet you keep, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's why I know how you're going to take care of my equipment, uh, pretty much. Uh, and then when I when I tell people, you know, okay, you're hired, I'll, I'll bring you on board. Well, what am I going to do? You know, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You hired me. So where are we going to find out what's best suited for you? <laughs> right. uh, you look pretty agile. Maybe you can be a repeller. You know, maybe you could run a battery van. Do you know computers? Oh, I can make a computer sing. Might put you in dispatch. A lot of people here went up from being a dispatch to a police dispatcher from Jan's Towing, you know, and they become fire captains, do all kinds of things. This is a stepping stone job. Yeah. So I try to bring the best out in people that they don't even know they have a best. That makes sense? It does. It yeah. It does. And so I'll just hire somebody because they, they seem to be a nice person and their background checks out good. And then we'll find out what they can do. And the biggest thing, the way we find that out, is we put them in different scenarios. We put them with different people. We have one uh, supervisor, Rick Martinez. I'll have them dr drive around with Rick for a day or two. And, and Rick will tell me, yeah, this guy's got it. This, this, this guy's a fit. Or, oh, no, no, I don't think so. You know, he, this, this isn't a good thing for him. So then we'll take him over to the battery side. Have Henry at Glendora over there, run, uh, let him run a battery van for a day with Henry and check cars and see if that's his niche. Everybody's got a niche. Yeah. And there's so many jobs here internally in my company. We'll find them a niche. Yeah. Whether it's working in the yard, driving a forklift, you know, cleaning trucks, cleaning auction, auction cars, you know, like I say, and dispatching. I keep messing, mentioning dispatch because this spot, dispatch is a hard deal to fill you for know sure. that's a very big responsibility for you got to sure. have people that can multitask not just do one thing they've got to be able to run a computer take a call or nine like like a 911 person you know yeah how, how do you let me see how i ask this question how do you know what is a a fair rate or fair price to tow a vehicle given like different circumstances because a lot of people will say sometimes the tow truck price is too much a record to pull out a a heavy duty vehicle i gotta pay thousand two three thousand dollars for that that's crazy how do you how, how do you guys like price and how do you make it fair for people i'm just interested in that yeah yeah um would you like, would you like come, come on in real come quick in and, here, and, Sue. And, sue's my operations manager of over 25 years Every year we submit rates with the state and um, your rates are averaged out in the area. So you have to be within 5% of the area average. So all of the uh, companies who provide service for this state agency, their rates are reviewed. They have to be within 5% of each other. And if you are too high, your rates are rejected and you must resubmit to have those rates be within that area average. Mm. And then um, we have, um, that's the rate that we then charge to all uh, the law enforcement agencies because that rate has already been determined by the state Got to it. be the fair and accurate rate for our, our area. Got it. So, you, I mean, so you really can't gouge there because there's you have to have a certain or be within a certain mm -hmm. number. As long as you are approved by that agency to do the towing, then yes, the rate is set. Now, if you're not providing state through that state agency, then unfortunately there is no regulation. Ah, so some people can. Your rate. So that's another way of, of defining 
maybe a reputable to non-reputable service. I like that. I like that. Is if, if you <clears throat> have been approved to participate with some of these agencies, your background checks have done, your it's uh, they're verifying that you're participating with what the law requires towing companies to participate with, and you're reviewed annually mm. to make sure that you are complying with those requirements. If you're not towing, for those agencies, nobody's checking on you. Nobody's making sure that you are in compliance with the law. Got it. So is there a way for like, let's say a, a person to quickly check that information out when somebody is like, if, if a, a tow truck company comes out, they can say, hey, I, I want to make sure that you're compliant within this state regulation. Is there a way for people to do that? Or is it kind of like it would take they too could, long? They could contact the, the local offices because the towing companies are not allowed to advertise that they actually tow for certain agencies. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it can be found out, but at the incident scene, uh, it might not be, you know, readily available. Like, let's say your accidents on a Saturday or Sunday, certain offices are closed on those days. So you're not going to be able to verify with that office. Got it. Who, who's a, an approved provider. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, that, I mean, that's great information. So make sure that you're always using an approved provider because their prices are going to be fair and they're going to be within reason of a yeah. certain number. Yeah. If you know they're an official police garage, normally you're getting legit service, but it's always good to have uh, insurance, whether mm. it's the auto club anything any type of insurance it's like medical insurance you got to have it nowadays yeah you know it's not not cheap people have insurance on their pets <laughs> right <laughs> right and towing insurance is one of those that people really need it's not cheap to tow because we have millions and millions of dollars of equipment out there to service people and a lot of staff standing by team members that are qualified to do the work and these people are standing by what does it cost a hospital to have trauma doctors stand by Per hour, right? That's a good point. Some of our guys, the level of licensing they have and for what they can do, and they're standing by. Some of these people get paid a lot of money. So uh, to have facilitate everything we do. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, that, that you explain that well, especially like you you drew that analogy between like a trauma doctor, like you have to pay people for their time, yeah. right? Whether the, they're being used or not, they're still there waiting to help you. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, and, and included with that analogy, you need a trauma doctor, you need a trauma doctor. If, if we need a commercial tow truck driver, we need a commercial tow truck driver. And we can't just go and hire any commercial driver. They have to know how to operate the towing equipment. And so you can't just put anyone into that truck and just say, go drive. Right. It, it's not that simple. They have to know how to operate the hydraulics, how to operate the winches, what, what, mm -hmm their load capacity is, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, yeah. That makes and, sense. And Ramel, I've, I've got something that uh, we've been working on with some attorneys and uh, things. Uh, it's kind of breaking news a little bit. Okay, let's something break else it. we're going to change the inter industry a little bit. Okay. And I'll break it with you right here. Let's do it. What Jan's Towing is going to do in the near future um, is we're on standby all the time for – 20 different agencies we tow for and do a good job. But the agencies that haven't selected us, but that are in our region, our area, we will help facilitate them if their tow company fails or if their employees go on strike or whatever might happen, their equipment breaks down or whatever. We're going to figure out how to charge a nominal fee to be on call for these cities so if they have a SIG alert, if they have a problem, now it won't be the state of the county. That's a different thing. This is I'm just only talking cities. Yeah. Um, where they can pay Jan's towing a little bit to stand by, even though they're contracted with somebody else, but they failed, they've got us to go to. Right. And we're getting paid to stand by. That makes yeah. sense? It makes sense. It makes sense. You ever heard of that one before? So not in towing, but like, you know, I come from a traditional trucking background and we have drivers on standby all the time. So yeah. you have a driver standby for four to eight hours and another driver is supposed to be on that route. And that driver will come in and you'll pay him a, a rate to stand by. If he yeah. does, you don't use him. He, he still gets paid because it's still his time. But if you do, right. now you have somebody to back that up. Yep. And so it makes got a, lot the of, equipment. A, lot of, a lot of sense. Got the equipment. We got everything. 
ready to roll for that city. So the city's not on lockdown. In other words, right. they're not sitting there with no tow trucks. They don't know who to call. We're, we're going to give them an emergency hotline and we will respond within a reasonable amount of time and, and clean up the accident or the impound, uh, whatever it is, tractor trailer flips, uh, cement mixer flips over. These are tragic incidents. And a lot of the times these companies that are out there, they don't, they can't go deep. Let's put it that way. Yeah. We could go pretty deep. Okay. And, and so we can help other cities feel comfortable only maybe having one tow truck company, you know, if that's all they have. Like that's they say, right. what are we going to do if there's a major catastrophe and they're busy? Does that happen often where yes. there's not a lot of yes. tow trucks in these cities? Yes, yes. Major, uh, a lot of big rig accidents, impounds and, and the cities, some of the cities just don't know, you know, what to do. Yeah. And I want to give them an answer. I want to help. I'm not here to take anybody's business or do anything. I'm just here to render an emergency service 24-7, including holidays, that will help fix the situation when other companies fail. And other companies fail. It happens. Right, right. I hope I never fail. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how far out from your local your, your area do you go? Do, will you dispatch your guys? Sue, what would you say, within a 10-mile radius? Well, no, it just depends on for who. We do have some accounts that, you know, they might break down near the beach, out in the desert, up in the mountains. Um, but we, we pretty much stick to Southern California um, as, uh, as a whole. But we do, the majority of our work is probably within a 20 mile radius from, from this location. Yeah. Um, but it, once again, depending on our accounts, cause we not just with the, what Jan's already mentioned, but we do have a large commercial base of towing accounts as well. Okay. So, um, wherever those commercial accounts break down within Southern California, we will go pick them up and take them where they need to go. What was a, what does a commercial account look like? Like who are you referring to when you say commercial account? Like what type of accounts? Um, trash truck companies. Okay. Trash truck. Got uh, it. Small fleets. Cement mix um, companies. Got it. Ready mix companies that pull the, the gravel trucks. So when they break down, they call you guys directly. They don't have to call anybody yeah. else. It's already right. set yeah. up. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Cool. Cool. Very, very, very interesting. Um, what's the next thing I wanted to ask off of that? Um, oh, what is your most expensive piece of equipment? I'm, 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 I'm curious. We, we've we got uh, an NRC 65 ton. Uh, back in the that? day, uh, it's a big rotator. <laughs> okay. And uh, it's actually a five axle. Yeah. Um, five five axle. It's got a pub on the very back and everything. And, and that truck there is a very viable piece of equipment because it's got a sliding rotating boom it slides on the back about 20 30 feet so you don't have to reposition the truck very much but to replace that truck right now i was at a tow show in vegas and talked to the gentleman over there and i think they're about a million four approximately don't hold me to that number but a million four and there's a long waiting line for those trucks mm. because they're so vis versatile you can literally pick up a semi truck and trailer and rotate it completely around this truck in the air Wow. They demonstrated that at a tow show in Vegas. That is crazy. It's, it's very impressive. And when we have one of those trucks, we have the little 40 tons uh, rotators. Uh, and and they are they run about close to a million dollars now for, you know, I just bought another one, a 50 ton, about a million bucks. So how often do you use something like that? All the time. All the time. I, I've decided to use the rotating tow trucks as a tow truck because when you get out on a tow, you never know what you're going to have. Um, it can be a, a vehicle, a heavy vehicle that's fallen into a sinkhole. And so you need that rotator to tow the vehicle. You need to lift it out of the hole, rotate it, put it over on hard ground, and then tow it. Sometimes if it's broken a leaf spring or suspension or popped a tire, whatever. Um, so I, my personal beliefs are the rotator is the way to go for everyday towing for big rigs. And uh, as long as you can get them to scale properly and uh, all that, uh, I, I think it's it's the winning edge. Uh, or they have some of the the what do you, the self mounted uh, quick tow deals, the quick hitches and stuff like that. You can put on regular uh, semi trucks. Those are pretty nice too for local mm. local stuff. Um, so there's several variations, but our trucks, even a flatbed nowadays, can cost you 130, 150 thousand dollars for a normal flatbed. Yeah. So this priced way. Uh, uh, it's a lot of money for new people coming into the industry. 
So we've decided we paid off most of our equipment and we've decided to purchase a few new trucks, but not go too crazy. We've increased our maintenance on the old ones and keep the old ones because they're so valuable. Yeah. Everybody they, don't, wants, they don't lose value. They don't lose value. Everybody wants a Jan spec truck, uh, especially the used ones. Because <laughs> the they're, 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 they're kept up great. The miles aren't too crazy on them. And I'm, I'm kind of crazy when it comes to the maintenance. I love uh, 90 day bit inspections, changing the oil all the time, keeping good tires on them. I'm just a fanatic about the walk around, to make sure everything's in order. Uh, so you don't go to a scene of an incident looking stupid. That's, That's right. the last thing you want to do is not have absorbent on you or something like that. And, you know, uh, for all the new people that are getting involved in towing, yep. just preparation. When you're there, look professional and uh, be professional, have the right equipment and uh, read a lot of magazines, read American Towman magazine, read Tow Times. It's a wealth of information out there. Mm. Got it. What's the fuel consumption like on those on those big, huge rotators? Five miles, five miles of the gallon. Some of them three and a half, uh, about five miles of the gallon on the average. You might get eight if you're pretty level, not in tow. Uh, and then the the littler ones are some of the Dodge. They have a little Cummings motor in them. The wheel lift trucks they get ten to thirteen. And the smaller ones, flatbeds are about ten to thirteen. It's all depending on how a driver drives and if he doesn't forget to click the overdrive button and all that or the, <laughs> the heavy use button. I think there's another power button on there they can press. Yeah. You know, can, can, can all you guys operate all your equipment or do you have certain no, guys that... Certain guys. Certain guys run certain trucks and I like to train them. I like them to be universal to some degree, but I don't want everybody here knowing how to run a big rig. And, Why not? Uh, it, there's too many, too many quarterbacks. <laughs> Got it. Got it. So those are the Navy SEALs. Then when they're, That's when they're it. coming in, I don't. The big I don't like the the head button and the and all that. You know, because those guys are. How many guys can fly a seven forty seven? That's true, right? So my beliefs are: you just have you know, few of those guys that are great that do the job, and uh, a lot of light duty stuff. You know, um, I, I really specialize in light duty. Um, I, I do the heavy duty too, but I don't push for it. I, I just is I light like duty light profitable. Duty. Yeah, the impounds and all that, it helps. It helps pay the bills. As long as insurance companies and the people pick up the vehicles and they don't, uh, you know, they don't uh, leave them in salvage dump. Some insurance companies will figure out it's a total or whatever and salvage dump. That's not, uh, that's not too nice. Yeah. You know, yeah. as long as people do the right thing and pick up the vehicle, get it to uh, a, a authorized dismantler, uh, wherever it's going to be, uh, uh, the parts sold or whatever, a pick apart type thing or a co part. Uh, those people are in and out of here all the time picking up vehicles. And yeah. we appreciate that service of them picking up the remnants of what was a car, you know? Got it. People can't see right now, but, and, I'll, and we'll probably show this while we talk about this, but you got like a thousand cars outside. Yeah. Like uh, there's a lot of cars outside. A lot of cars. Maybe not a thousand, yeah. but a yeah. lot. Yeah, we got a lot. So hundreds. Hundreds of cars. It yeah. feels like a thousand when you drive through there. Yep. So what. And you do, you do auction, right? Yep, every Saturday. T tell me about that business and how that started. It, it um, well, you've got to cycle the cars. And, and I just don't like calling up the junkyard and saying, hey, I've got this many. Because you, you got to have people that bid on them so you get the most that you can out of the vehicles. Because that's a, you know, part of the recovery price uh, that you got to put back in your business. Uh, you can't give everything away. Right? <laughs> that's so, right. That's right. Yeah. So, you, you know, you get the most you can out of them. So we... We'll put air in the tires or sometimes replace a tire, uh, put a battery in some of them, uh, clean them up a little bit, wash them, and, and see if it's a good transportation car for somebody. I don't want to see somebody get stuck with one because there's a reason why all these cars are here in the impound yard. That's right. You know, um, and I'm, it's almost like I look at these cars and I want to tell them, you know, okay, tell me your story. You know, but <laughs> you got to play detective and figure out the story. Yeah. You know, are the tags way expired? Is it a gross polluter? Somebody got the catalytic converter. What's the meat of the matter here? Let's, we got to give this car a physical. Right. And then get it to run. Make sure it's got oil and water and, and then show it the best you can. Uh, we use a hub called Joyride. And uh, so we do a hybrid auction. So Joyride is, is on the internet live. And uh, Susan, a gal you just saw there, she's the auctioneer on Saturdays. So we do a live auction as well as on the hybrid. So if you're in, in the river kicking back on your pontoon boat and you already previewed the cars or you like what you see online, you can still buy the car 
and be at the river, have a Dos Equis if you want. <laughs> <laughs> we try to make it make user it fun. friendly, for fun for everybody. So if they want a car, they don't have to hold back and say, I don't want to go on that trip or I don't want to do this or do that. They can, as long as they can have a computer or an iPad or whatever, they can still bid. Oh, Sign up Joy with Joyride. Ride I've never heard of Joyride. Have yeah. you guys heard of that? I've never heard of that it, it's before. A, That's it's pretty a cool. It's great people. They come out, George and everybody with Joyride. They're wonderful people. I can't say enough about them. Um, anybody that has some cars, I'd highly recommend sign up with Joyride and give them an opportunity to get rid of some vehicles. You don't yeah. have to have an auction every week. I mean, if it's once a month or twice, you know, uh, once a quarter, whatever. Yeah. But it's a way, great way to get rid of things. And you find uh, a, a broader market. You find, uh, find people that will take these cars and use them, whether it's a front end of a car or, you know, or a motor or whatever, if it's a junk car. Th there's parts on these cars that people need, and it's about marketing. Yeah, got it. If you could list like your, your revenue streams from top to bottom, what would be like the top and then what would be like the, the lowest things in terms of margins and what makes the most money? Well, if you can, like, of course, it, it costs the most money to do mountain recoveries, but you get paid the most. Yeah. Uh, or a freeway recovery. Uh, you get paid the most to do those. Which call it free wave? A freeway recoveries. So if they have a, a vehicle flipped over. Okay. A, you know, tractor trailer or whatever. Um, uh a lot of the heavy stuff pays good, but then your regular light duty police stuff pays good too. So it's hard to really break it down. Um, I, I, I kind of feel like I, I just doing a lot of the smaller, uh, toes and, and getting them done. Uh, yeah, if you've had, if you've got 20 or 30 trucks out there on a given day running and picking up impounds, <laughs> you know, you're doing, you're doing good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so you don't need all the semi drivers. You don't need a regular class driver can do them and do an efficient job and you can pay them well. And it's a good source of income. Got it. And and how much how many uh, impounds would you say you guys do like a week? A week? It's really hard to or judge. A day. Let's say a, a day. A, a day. It can be anywhere from anywhere from 10 to 30. 10 to 30. Impounds. Yeah. A day. That's a lot. It, it's yeah. But then overall toes can be anywhere from 100 to 300 toes a day. So we, we seem to fall in that bracket of 150 to 250 toes per day. Um, anything, any call for service, whether it's a PPI, whether it's a club call, uh, a commercial call, just a COD, whatever it is falls in that basket. Yeah. And so there's a lot of volume. Uh, we normally have to have two dispatchers on at least to take calls. Then we have backup dispatchers. We have a lot of lines. Um, if the telephones go down, I'd highly recommend have a couple cell phones, like a hotline, if you're going to do police towing. Mm. So that way you can depend on a cell phone. Uh, cell phones work great nowadays. I can't wait till we can have more uh, correspondence from the mountains. We seem to have a problem. We have some uh, some ways to text via satellite uh, with the mountaineering people. Uh, I heard Apple's coming out with a new program or a new phone that, for an additional cost, might work up in the mountains. Okay. Um, it's just hard. Radio transmissions and everything, it's difficult up on the mountains. Got it. What about technology? What, what, what kind of tech are you guys implementing in your business to make things easier for you and your drivers, your dispatchers? Talk about that. Well, I, like I was showing you earlier when we were talking, I like lighting. I, I love lighting. I, I love uh, tools. Um, I, 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 love, uh, I love looking at new equipment. Uh, we recently bought a new battery van at a tow show. And the ease of pulling the batteries out, for instance, you don't have to bend over. You can just pull the batteries off on out on a shelf. And uh, I think the ease using your mind instead of your back, I think that makes the most sense. <laughs> yeah. And making it the ease for the employees, too. I, I'd rather them work that old saying, work smarter than harder. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so I've tried to do that with all of our equipment, you know, um, and, and sometimes a little simple thing, like what we're saying, talking about here, if, if a driver's seat looks a little torn up or whatever, I'll, I won't i will just send it to an upholsterer necessarily. If the truck's got over 100,000 miles on it, I'll just replace the entire air seat, pull it out. Because that, how nice is it at your home to have a nice seat at your desk, right? Yeah. You know, that's where a driver sits all the time. So I respect that. And I want them to have a nice cushion ride. Uh, they work better when they have a nice seat. And they don't have springs po poking them in the back or the, you know, any place else. No doubt. What's your thoughts on electric vehicles? It, it's it's coming, right? Especially yeah, in California. What are you guys it, doing to prepare for that? It, it's coming. The technology is still, I believe, way behind. I, I think 
I really am in favor of the hybrids. I love to have a backup, have that gas motor in there, the Priuses or whatever. Teslas are good. They're like a big battering ram, though. If you hit somebody, there's a lot of weight there with those batteries. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> That's right. They, they, they take a crash pretty good, but then the other vehicles, they, they do some damage. Um, but I love the vehicle. I think it's a nice vehicle. They're, they're on the right track. Uh, charging stations and stuff like that. I don't know where it's going to go. You know, I'd love to get a supercharger to have in a van and go around. And I'd rather charge these electric vehicles rather than um, tow them to a, a charge station. Yeah. So I'm looking into that. Some local stations are starting to charge them and stuff. But I want to be careful of liability. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Uh, and, and especially if it's not hooked up right or maybe you shouldn't be charging it or get in trouble for charging a vehicle and short, getting accused of shorting something out. That's right. That maybe that was shorted out in the first place. You. Maybe that's maybe that's why you're towing it in the first place or going out to jumpstart it because it wasn't working. Yeah. So I, I just don't like liability. That, yeah. That's the whole thing. I've Even my jump boxes, another thing I can mention, we have certain jump boxes that their reverse polarity, uh, that they won't charge if you hook up the battery cables wrong. Mm. That's one of the biggest things in the trucking and towing industry I can tell you to do. A little red light comes on, says, nope. But if it's green, flip, you know, have the switch on. Got your 12 volts there, it'll fire up, and you're not going to short out an alternator or a computer brain. Uh, a lot of little things like that that, yeah. I, that I've implemented. Because we used to get accused of everybody's brain going out. Uh, you know, you jump. <laughs> come on, we didn't do that. We didn't. Oh, I saw a spark. Well, you're going to see a spark when you connect a, a charge to something and charge it. You're going to see that. And if somebody's got a sulfating battery or a shorted battery, a lot of things we can get accused of. So I, I've made things where we just don't get accused. They can't point their fingers at me. Yeah. I think to cut down liability and people don't mean to do it, but they do it because you touched it, you know? Right. So they want to blame something, somebody, they don't understand that it's a process we're going through. Let's test it. Let's figure out what happened here. You know, we do this all the time. So uh, anyhow, the good jump boxes with no reverse polarity, I think are huge uh, for electrical problems because electrical problems, they're a gremlin in most cars and trucks, as we all know. Got it. What is, what is the, the, the most challenging thing about this industry right now for you? Insurance. Uh, insurance and uh, workers' comp. Um, we, we're very fortunate. We, we have a good safety program. And the way I, uh, people frowned on it originally, but the way I kind of work our safety program, I like putting people that like to do the NASCAR towing. I tow at the local tracks. I did tow at uh, Fontana Speedway. We've towed at Sonoma Speedway for NASCAR. Been live on TV. Uh, done all the indie indie cars and yeah. have the big long booms that nobody else had and was able to pick up the whole indie car straight up in the air and all that. So we we've been through a lot of that over the years. It's been a lot of fun uh, in uh, figuring out a way to haul those. Yep. And and so I think by having the NASCAR tracks locally. It's a great training place for people to learn and uh, to have veterans train new people that are coming in. Uh, uh, knowledge is, is everything. And, and unfortunately, in the towing industry, it, it takes a long time to learn this trade. It, it's not something you learn overnight. And the biggest thing is safety. I just can't stress safety enough. There's controls on both sides of the truck. Use them. If they're on the passenger side, use those controls. Don't don't put your backside out there in the traffic lanes. There's no need to, you know, wait till traffic clears. If you need a traffic break, get the highway patrol out. Get somebody out that can help you. Yeah. Uh, Got it. Talk to me about about branding, because you, you seem like you're very into marketing and branding. I don't know if it's intentional or if it's just who you are, your personality, but you've been, I, I'm just, as I walk around, you have a lot of little things that you just, you're branding Jan's towing in a way. What was the purpose for that? And, and just talk to your thoughts around branding. We've, we've always been involved in golf tournaments and giving out, giving things out, giving things away. So I, I came up with this bright idea, you know, uh, well, we're giving away mugs. Why don't we, our name, how come our name's not on these mugs or the pins or the pencils? Or now we give out e-glue backpacks with our names on them and a nice little logo, uh, T-shirts. Uh, there's ways you can spend money for advertising and you're giving people something that they're going to use. And uh, sometimes the gifts aren't cheap, but they're a nice gift and they're going to use them. And I, I like to brand where 
things have a shelf life. Everything's got a shelf life. I, I don't like to give somebody something that, uh, like, I put names on umbrellas and all that kind of stuff, but they're only going to use them in the rain or the hot sun. I, I like to u- put my name on things that are going to be there and last a long time. It's got a long shelf life. That's what I call it. Mm. Uh, it's going to be there. And uh, so Where did you was, get that from? Just learning. Just, um, you know, back in the day, I would put, uh, I'd give people stickers, and we'd put a sticker on the inside of their glove compartment box and Jan's towing, if you ever need me here, I'm going to put a sticker in there for you. Do you mind? Is that okay? I put it on their door jam, just like an oil change thing. My number's right there. If you ever break down, you're local, just call me. I'll take care of you. So uh, branding, the signs, the PPI, 6,000 properties. How much would it cost you to have 6,000 people out there holding a sign? So I go by and I salute those I salute those poles that hold those signs, and I thank them. And uh, yeah, and then and then we got little keychains. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. I've even got these. These were uh, made up for keys, and they've got Jan's towing, and they got the flag uh, on them. Simple. And I, I make up thousands of these and and pass them out, and uh, they just go on there and little key fob thing. Yeah. Uh, so we, we've done so much marketing and i think i just love shelf life i like seeing our name around uh like i tell people if you think of soup what kind of soup you think of right campbell's you know progressa what right but so in the local region here think of towing jan's towing why not they're pillars in all these communities they help out they give back they're you know we do when a community reaches out to us we do whatever we can do, and yeah, we'll brand our name. I think it's a fair exchange to give out things to the community, you know. Uh, and I want them to be proud of that brand. I, I whether it's uh, for the kids, uh, whatever it might be, I want them to be proud and wear that and want them. People call us. Hey, do you have any shirts? I gave out six or eight shirts this morning. People call and they want shirts, and they want those backpacks. I know? asked for a shirt. Soon I yeah, came see, in. I'm yeah. like, I, I need a shirt. And and, and shirts are wonderful. I, I love that type of thing. Um, it, it's to me, it's once you buy the shirt and give it to somebody and they like you, I mean, if one of your competitors don't like you, they'll take it and use it to wipe their wheels or something. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if they like you, they'll, that thing's got a long shelf life. And I've got people to give me shirts from 25 years ago. Say, Hey, I think you should have this. This is really cool. And I thank them for it. Brand new in the package. You know, I'm like, wow, look at this. We have so many designs. We've probably got 10 different designs of our shirts yeah. that we've had over the years. And we can still print them up and go back and, the, you know, do a collage of them. And uh, But shirts is one. There's a, just a lot of stuff there. The name, the Jans towing. There was a gentleman... Uh, you want to talk about the name Jans, how we came up with the surfboard and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, I was going to get into that, the yeah. whole... Oh. Hawaii thing going on in yeah. here. As you see, we have I, a surfboard here. Yeah, I, <laughs> and I, yeah, go ahead. It just, I, I, I feel terrible what's happened with Lahaina right there. We live there part time, uh, my family and I, uh, over in uh, Kanapali. We lived in Kapalua and we'd frequent Lahaina a lot. My son went to school there. And I, I feel absolutely devastated because we still have friends, family that were on the island. Um, and in, in saying that, Izzy was uh, a very famous singer. Uh, he sang Over the Rainbow. Uh, and, and when he passed, they had this big funeral for him out in the water. And they had, everybody was on paddle boards and flowers, lays. And I said, wow, that's cool. Um, I just visioned this surfboard with a lay around it. And in remembrance of him and that song, and it's just a special place, and uh, everybody likes it over there in the in the islands. And uh, so that's how I came up with the surfboard and the name in the center of that was because of his funeral uh, out to sea. Mm. They threw his ashes out there and wow. sang, and and it was a very nice. It was the best going away funeral I think I've ever seen. Um, so anyhow, that's that's how I really it haven't came. really told anybody that, but that's yeah. how. Wow. The name came to me on the on the trucks like that. It used to be just a regular graphic, just a plain Jane type thing. And I think by adding the flowers to the trucks, I, I've told people, um, if you really want to be creative, I, I think half of our customers are men. Half of them are ladies. You got to figure out a way to brand and to market towards the ladies. Yeah. Most people don't do that. They don't even think about it. <laughs> so... 
a, a lady will get in a crash and she'll to, tell the local police agency, uh, which which company do you want, ma'am? Uh, I want the one with the flowers on it. <laughs> You're right. <And> so, <laughs> that is smart. So right. we, we've got trucks with flowers, butterflies, hummingbirds, and, and the kids love them. And we do touch a truck at the schools and do different things. So when the kids see a flower on a tow truck, they don't need to be scared of that tow truck at the scene of an accident. It's a friendly place. It's a safe haven to come to us. We'll help you. Uh, we're not there to hurt you. And so I think it speaks a lot of the industry. Uh and then just to have those flowers, I, I just, uh, it's special for the ladies. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. That's so smart, too, because you think about it. Most tow trucks, you see like a skull or like fire, <laughs> brimstone. It's like, dragons. It's like yeah, dragons. <laughs> but you just took a whole different approach. Like, no, nah, we're soft. We're helpful. We're coming to help you. We're saving the day. Yeah. But you're right. And, and like you said, the, the lady, the, the woman is going to say the, the company with the flowers on it. That is so smart. Man, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I, I like how you think, man. I love I love how you think. All right. So 45 or 40, almost 50 years in business. Yeah. What does an exit look like for you? When will you when will you stop? I probably won't. You won't? No, this will this will be it for me. You know, I love doing what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody ever made you an offer to buy your company? Yeah. A lot of people, but money's not everything. And I have enough facility money and uh, to do what I need to do and help people around me. My my goal in life is to help people that have helped me around me, staff members, and uh, I, I I'm a giver. I like to help them, and if I'm not around someday, who knows? They might be running this place and making the money. <laughs> you know, um, I'll make sure my immediate family's handled, taken care of. But this this uh, this possibly could go back to the people that helped build it. Yeah. Is that your plan? That's pretty much a plan. Yeah, I, I'd like to do that. You know, uh, I, I don't want them to look for a job. I, I'd, I'd rather them be able to work here, make a good living, and maybe, maybe be stockholders. I don't know how all that stuff works. But <laughs> you got to sure, figure it out. I'm sure there's enough to go around for everybody. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, for sure. You, 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 I, I can tell you love your business. You're very emotional about your business. What, 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 what's, 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 where's that emotion coming from? My heart. I, I just, uh, I've, I've had very good friends in my life and I've been very selective of my friends, uh, that I've hung around to, uh, hung, hung around with. Um, and, uh, it's just, I, I just, I don't know what would happen if we weren't here in the local area. And we support and help so many people. I, I just don't want to leave them without in this local area. And I don't want to leave my staff members without. Yeah. You know, I think together, the community and our team, we just make it click and work. And, and oh, thank you. <laughs> and I see, uh, I, you know, it's, it's I'll go to a local, uh, a local diner or whatever and, When you're sitting at a table having coffee and some eggs and one person says, hey, are you Jan? Yeah, I'm, I'm Jan. Oh, thank goodness for you. You are so nice. You helped me out the other day. Or you, your company did this or did that. You hear all these stories. Then another table starts chattering about what you did. Then another table starts chattering. Then before you know it, you got four people talking about you and your company and you're almost embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> you want to leave, you know, right? Like, oh my wanna, God, I can't but take you, this. But you realize how many hundreds and actually thousands of calls that we've ran locally in these areas and helped people. And we're not here to hurt them. We're here to help them. And I know sometimes uh, we might not be the best of friends because we're an ag agent for the police. They have their vehicles brought in for one reason or another, but we're just hired to bring that vehicle in for safekeeping. Um, but the people... Uh, in those diners where we go, frequent, it's a warm feeling. You you feel like you have purpose, like you're you were put here for a real reason. Yeah, you know, yeah. to help. And yeah. I I feel like I have so much purpose, I can't stop. Hmm. Does that make sense? Makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, purpose is everything, man. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I just love doing what I do. I I love being around the people that are here. They're my extended family. They're they're just they're wonderful people. They're very giving. I, I I could never have people work for me that weren't givers. 
that didn't want to go up and beyond, that just want to collect a paycheck. This isn't the job for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they've got to be uh, a, a, a good hearted person that really understands the business and wants to help people and be excited about helping people. That's, that's the, that's the whole thing. The excitement that it draws back to you. It, it's very, it gives back to you. That's all I can say it. The other night we did a recovery and I helped, I ran out and helped set up the lighting and everything. And Steve, one of our heavy drivers was there in the rotator. Oh, you still go out? And Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I go out a lot. Okay. I, I, I go out and I try to be one of the first ones on scene. So I know what's going on and I can tell, I'm like the coach telling everybody, you know, what the play is going to be. Let's, <laughs> let's do this. We'll let's roll this one out. Let's, yeah. I want this person to do it. Cause you know, I know he can, he's agile enough. Um, so I, I like to call the shots when it comes down to that stuff to some degree or my supervisors are, they can do a great job at that also. Um, but, uh, I, I think one of the most rewarding things is when you go out and you lift a car over a house and over some big, huge pine trees that's went through a house basically. And, and you do such a good job. All the neighbors are out and it's, let's say it's midnight and, uh, it's, you've got it lit up like daylight. And uh, so everybody can see see what's going on and be safe. And when you're all done and you set the car on the flatbed that was crashed or whatever, and the neighborhood applauds you. Mm, standing ovation. Standing ovation. And they thank us. It's how much it, you don't need. It's not about the money. It's about that's such a reward. You help them. And, and just it's just about helping people. You know, all these people now that are going to help people in in Maui and all the giving and everything, you know, we've got some people that are going to come stay with us that are our friends there that lost everything. If you can imagine having a bank burn down and have everything in that bank, the safe burnt, everything burnt, stocks, bonds, whatever you had gone. So we're, we're helping people that have lost nearly everything come wow. over here back to the mainland because some of the people don't want to be there anymore. It's sad. But they're going to rebuild and they'll be fine eventually. Just a real sad part of our lives right now. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely tough. Um, you, you said it's not about the money, and I definitely agree with that. Um, but when you enrich people and you create a business of value, obviously you're going to be rewarded for that. How much is this business worth? Um, really hard to say. It's Roughly. millions and millions of dollars. You know, you. You figure in property alone, you got maybe fifteen, twenty million dollars in properties, and you know uh, what's a company worth that makes as much as we make a month? I mean, it, I, I don't know. The company itself, maybe thirty, forty million dollars plus properties, you know. And I'm talking trucks and everything, you know. Yeah. So you're, you know, when you bundle it all up, you bundle it all up. It's quite a bit of money. It's millions of dollars. Yeah, you know. But that means nothing to you. No. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> I can I'm just, tell. I'm just a normal guy. Yeah. Wear shorts and kick back and eat hot dogs out of our <laughs> hot dog machine there for lunch, you know? Yeah. But hey, if, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind talking to Susan for a few minutes? Yeah, sure. Would you mind? Sure. I, I'd love to talk to Susan. Hey, before, you, yeah. before you jump off, though, we always have like a final thought. Uh -huh. And I'd like to just get your final thought for our people. Just something entrepreneurial, something you give people. Um just to you know kind of end on a, a note just something you want to like leave the audience with just no matter how hard it gets just keep working and reach out to people that have life experience respect people's opinion that are older that tell you i've been there i know how to do this i often would have coffee with people and i would tell them and people these people i would call a geni genius and i would ask them uh Hey, do you mind having coffee with me? No, what's up? I, I just don't need you to talk to me or anything, really. I just need you to pull your brain out of your head, sit it on the table. I need to pick that brain on that table and have dinner with you real quick. But I don't want to talk about anything else other than the questions I'm going to ask you. Right. And so I do that a lot. I still do it to this day because I have people that were teachers that they're in their 80s now, and I talk to them gracefully and tell them how important they were in my life mentors so mentors never be as scared to talk to older people mentors and some of the young kids too can be such good mentors 
we have a lot of good kids out there that are learning aggressively. And if they'll listen to the older people too, it, they'll grow faster. So I think that's the word of the day. I and love just that. be kind. Just be kind to people. Don't worry about the money. You know, as long as you can pay your bills, the money will come. Just work hard every day of the week. You know, I love it. I, I, love I, it. I still work 24 7. I love it. I love it. I live it. I'm here. I, I'm like a. I'm like working at a fire department. I eat, sleep. I, I I have to be here. I'm on call. So, but this is my life. This is what I've chose. This is my career. I'm all in. And all the departments, everybody around, they know. I'm all in. Yeah. yeah. And I'll be here till the end. <laughs> That's right. Man, all right sir. I appreciate you, man. Thank you so you much. Too. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And we'll turn it over here to Susan, huh? Yeah, come on. Come on in, Susan. We're going to talk some operations. And she's fun. She's, this is the genius here. She's. Okay. All right. So we're here with Susan. Um, Susan, what, what's your role here at, at Jan's Towing? I'm the operations manager. Operations manager. So we're going to get into the operations. So just talk to me about um, what's, the, what's the daily, what, what do things look like kind of daily um, in this operation? Um, for you guys every day is different you never know what type of calls you're going to have what type of challenges you're going to have um, we do have a great support staff uh, dispatchers front office back office um, supervisors um, so we do have uh, a great support staff and, and most of them can handle just about any situation so I feel like my roles kind of turned into more of a of a overseer or guidance than you know than actually having to do uh, a day-to-day -day pos position per se but as the operations manager i never know what one day is going to look like to the next got it who are you who are you working with mostly like are you more so facilitating things amongst a team or are you dealing with like the sales aspect of things like what's more like your role lead towards all of it all of it i'm I am, I have a hand in every cookie jar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Got it. So when, when a call kind of comes into the center, um, it goes, just tell us about how things kind of work around here. So people understand the flow of what happens and you can kind of break it down. Like you have your AAA calls, you have your police towing calls, you have like the search and recovery, kind of explain how things kind of flow through and from the top down, the, fun, the top of the funnel down. So if you were to call in and you needed a tow, um, we try to have a minimum of, well, first of all, our, our calls are answered in-house 24-7. Um, we don't have an outside service. We don't have an answering service. All calls are answered by a Jans towing employee. Which is important. Hours a day, seven days a week. Make very, that distinction. <laughs> very important. Um, during the day, we do try to make sure that 70 to 75 percent of those calls are answered directly by our dispatcher because that does just, um, how would you say, um, it gets everything facilitated correctly from the very beginning. Um, when the dispatch can take the call, if it's uh, if you're calling um, to check on the status of your vehicle that's being stored here, or how to get your property or hours, then you know somebody then the dispatch will shift you to the to the front desk. If you're calling about a billing question, they'll get you transferred to the back office. So our our dispatchers are are also kind of our operators, but we like our dispatchers to answer as many phone calls as possible because our largest amount of calls are requesting service. Got you, got you. So what's the bulk, the bulk of the calls daily are coming in for what purpose? Um, pretty much for, uh, for a tow or service call request, uh, okay. either from a law enforcement agency, a private property account, a commercial account, um, a COD customer, um, 75 to 80 percent of our phone calls per day are in regards to um, gener a, a business generating phone call. Got it. OK, so that call comes in and then you're dispatching that out to the different drivers. You have drivers that are out already. Are they hanging around? How, where, where are the guys or, uh, or the or the gals? Typically, they're out in the field um, already. Um, and then we just set up as efficiently as we can where their next call will be, whether that's um, for an emergency roadside service, for law enforcement, um, or for a commercial account. We just, uh, we only staff drivers that can run 
all of our calls, meaning even if you're a light duty, you've been approved for law enforcement, you've been approved for the roadside service, and therefore, since you've already passed those two uh, vigorous background checks, we know that you're going to be safe to the to our motoring public. So our commercial accounts and our COD service, we're confident you'll be able to provide exemplary service to them as well. Got it. When someone gets on the scene of a, a tow, let's say it's like a heavy duty, needs like a wrecker or something like that. Um, walk me kind of through like how it goes from them arriving on the scene to understanding, you know, what the cost is going to be, what the billing is going to be. Like, are you how, how do you get the insurance companies involved? Like trying to take me through that, through those steps. Um, we had a perfect one the other day. Um, we had a vehicle that uh, missed its stop sign and ended up in somebody's front yard. Thank God they missed the house. Oh, wow. They did go through the fencing and uh, inches away from the house. Um, the driver and we were just called for an accident. We were not told anything that happened. So the driver arrived on scene and uh, clearly knew that he was going to need some more assistance. Right. So um, Jan told them to go ahead and call in the heavy duty driver. Uh, Jan and myself drove to the incident. We checked it out. We verified um, what was what equipment was going to be needed how to back it out and um so from there jan and i just start contacting uh those drivers uh of the trucks that we need um if we need um you know accident assistance um you know physical removal of of the fencing or or items to get the vehicle out and all of that is um set forth like i stated earlier in that pricing from that state agency and so all the rates we already know what the rates are they're already set and um, they're all hourly rates so um, however long the equipment that was being used or the personnel that was being used all of those will break down hourly uh, typically we don't find out about um, insurance until the registered owner of the vehicle contacts us or their insurance company contacts us um, and then we handle all the releasing to the insurance agencies um, through the registered owner and help them get their vehicles on to the next location either for repair or um, for salvage whatever the that you know the insurance company decides got you what's the biggest lesson that Jan has taught you mm. <laughs> um probably to trust in myself mm. got you trust in yourself was there ever a moment where you did it every day got you so he's <laughs> empowered you to say trust trust yourself trust yeah, your gut because um you know i i'm a big second guesser over analyzer overthinker whatever you want to call it and of course i do it to myself more than i do it to anybody else so yeah. um I also uh, prepare all of our contracts that, you know, if, if we're putting something out to bid, if, if we're turning in an RFP, I'm the person that's preparing those. Mm -hmm. So I always have like this uh, big doubt that <laughs> it was done right or prepared properly. And right. um, so he always tells me, don't overthink it, you know. And and knock on wood, they've always seemed to work out. Work out. So. Gotcha. How often are you are you putting in uh, submitting new RFPs and so forth? Is that a, something you're doing on a regular basis, or is that like every year or? Well, quarter? for the for the state, it's every year. Um, I believe the county is every three years, and uh, the different cities just depends when their um, when their RFP request for proposals come due. Got it. Typically, they're anywhere from three to five years. OK, got it. And when you do these RFPs, are you kind of looking at what you guys did previous contract and, and then like, you know, uh, I guess an inflation and you kind of mark it up a little bit based on that? How does that kind of work? Well, the first thing that I do is I always uh, read what they're requesting and to, um, and discuss with uh, Jan if it's something that we want to submit for, if it's um, within our parameters. If it's um, so, then once we make that decision, um, 
then yes, I, I always go over and make sure that um, whatever our response is, is adequate to their, um, their request. And um, again, based on that state rate, we try to keep all of our the cities that we provide service for equal to that state rate. So Got everybody it. is getting that fair um, assessed rate. Got it. What would be an example of something you wouldn't want to provide for? Because you said you want to you have to make it's sure it's not necessarily that we wouldn't want to provide for, but um, a lot of the cities around here um, request a franchise fee. Mm. So if they're requesting a franchise fee that we just um, aren't in agreement with, then we just won't respond to their. What is a franchise fee? I don't understand that. Um, it in some cities it's a flat rate for get, for the city awarding you that contract. You pay the city back that oh, rate. Okay. Um, in other cities, it's a percentage of your gross receipts. Really, I never heard of that before. Okay, a franchise fee, huh? Yes, sir. Got it. So that's something that we frown upon. I mean, it's like they're just taking the money for no reason, basically. <laughs> the, the state of California allows them uh, to recover their costs of uh, towing. And um, the way that they have found to recover their costs of towing is to request uh, some of the towing and storage fees back from their towing provider. Mm. Um so because of our experience in the industry and uh, participating with communities that request the franchise fee, we have assessed our business at what we feel is, is our fair limit. And if somebody's requesting over that limit, then we have just chosen in the past not to respond uh, to their RFP. That would be the biggest reason that there have been um, RFPs that we haven't responded to. Um, the request for service, we are always, um, I shouldn't say always, but most of the time with what we offer, we exceed their request for service. So that's not an issue uh, for us as far as providing the service. Our biggest thing would be their franchise fee request. Got it. What's the biggest misconception about this industry to you? that everybody is a, a thief or an ex-con or, you know, the, the towing industry really does still to this day have a bad reputation. And I really don't understand that because I've been in this industry now for over 25 years. And most of the employees uh, that we have had and other business owners that I have the pleasure of knowing really are in it because they truly like to help people. They truly like to help the motoring public. They truly like to give back. And um, so, you know, I, I, I know that there's companies that maybe are not um, so well represented, but I think we could say that almost about any industry. So for the towing and trucking industry to kind of get that bad reputation that it has, you know, everybody's on drugs. Well, I have almost 50 <laughs> employees and nobody's on drugs. Right. I have almost 50 employees and, and I don't have felons, you know. So you, you would really just like those mis or, or that the worst one for me is that that we're all thieves. Mm. We're all thieves. Um, me and, and this company, we don't care what you left in your car. What you left in your car will be in your car when you pick up your car. Right. Um, we don't go out and pick which vehicles are going to get impounded. The law enforcement agency does that. So those general stereotypes and, you know, unfortunately, stereotypes aren't going anywhere anytime soon. For sure. When you when you quote a uh, or when you price a, a tow, what is that comprised of? Like, what are the components of it? Is it like the miles plus the pickup fee? Plus, like, how, how does how does that work? Um, for just a just CO, a general, just a general COD service. Um, well, first we assess what type of vehicle you need towed. Okay. And um, and what's wrong with your vehicle? If your vehicle just you know overheated and you need a tow, um, then you're just going to get our ba whatever our basic rate for that time. And we typically do it by hookup fee and a per mile fee okay so um 
But then if your vehicle is involved in an accident and you've got a broken axle and, you know, you need to, then, you know, we might uh, raise that hookup fee from the basic fee to a higher fee to allow the time that's going to be involved uh, to load your vehicle safely and properly and then go to the per mile fee. Okay. And then, of course, if you are, you know, in a medium duty or a heavy duty, and again, all of those same questions fall into place. You know, what type of tow, and is it a tow or is it a recovery? And and so the fees just get assessed uh, based on the type of vehicle and the type of towing that's required. Got it. And my final question is, what advice would you give somebody who wants to break into this industry? What what, <coughs> what, what would you tell them? Or they're, or they're new in this industry. They're already getting started. They have one truck, but they want to grow to be a, a, a large company like, like this or a mid-sized company like this. What, would you, what advice would you give them? Start slow. Um, so many people go out and they buy that one truck and they're hooked. Because there's, you know, once you find it, you're, whatever your self-igniter is, you found it, right? Yeah. Jan is, you know... 45 years in and he's still loving it every day. <laughs> but so then they want to run out and they want to get two, three, four trucks. Well, now you've, like Jan said, you have to have the land. You have to have employees. Yeah, you yeah. have to have everything that goes with that. Truck insurance, workers' comp insurance, property insurance, property taxes, property payments, truck payments, taxes on the payroll. And before you know it, some of these uh, young men and women that have started out on their own, they're so overwhelmed that now they're selling off those trucks. Now they're selling that property. And I, I don't want anyone to get deflated or lose their dream, but build on it. I was reading an article about somebody who uh, was building um, generational wealth for her and her family. And she said, I started one duplex at a time. I bought my first duplex. I lived on one side, rented the other side until I had enough saved to buy the next one. And that's what people need to realize with any business, whether it's towing, restaurant, whatever your fire is. Keep that slow burn so you're burning. Yeah. Because if you burn out, you burned out. <laughs> I love that. That's great advice. Great, great advice. Thank you, Susan. I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, a big thing that we do, and you, you can always reach out to me through social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. I'll, I'll respond to you. Um, put a friend request in, whatever. And uh, I think uh, one of the biggest things we've done to be innovative. You've probably, a lot of you have seen our uh, Facebook and our social media. Um, David, our social media person, is absolutely instrumental in bringing you a lot of these fine shots. And we've actually trained some of our team members, uh, given the right equipment to film and to do different things, to forward them to David so we can showcase what we do. And uh, that's all part of branding and everything because everybody likes to see a recovery. We don't want to see people hurt. We don't try to put those videos out there at all. And we try not even to video those scenes. But uh, David, uh, for the public relations, uh, whether it go into a chamber of commerce event, a golf tournament, and being a social media guy to help us the past few years uh, has really stepped our business up. So for those who are wishing you, for those of you wishing to expand your business or to grow, I would suggest a lot of social media uh, as much as possible. Don't be shy, put it out there. And uh, like we're doing, I'm not shy. I'm giving you a lot of secrets because <laughs> I want you to do good. I'm not here because I don't want you to do good. I'm a, I'm a giver, I'm not a taker. So if I was a taker, I wouldn't be giving you a lot of trade secrets and telling you how to do this and That's right. the combination to the safe. That's right. That's right. <laughs> everybody don't give the combination to the same. No, you, that's you know, for sure. But you can't teach everybody how to hit a three pointer. So if you fail at this, you'll you'll do well with something else. So just don't give up. You know, it's. But uh, social media is phenomenal. Don't you know? Like what we're doing here, this is the best stuff you can do. It's good medicine. Yes, sir. Did anybody have to convince you to get involved in social media? Or was it natural for you? It, it came natural, a little at a time. 
I started seeing us out there and people were saying they'd see us on social media or at awards banquet or whatever. And, uh, and I think it just, it felt good passing a good message along, uh, for people. You have a certain amount of people that are your, your rooters that root you on that are your cheerleaders and they watch you, they follow you. And whether they're close friends, family, whoever it is, some people live a boring life. That's true. And if we can make that life instrumental and give them purpose along with our purpose, it's really saying something. I, I, I like the fact that people find us interesting and want to follow us. You know, I, I, I hope this reaches out to a lot of people. I would love to see our team members be on social media, maybe even TV someday. I was going to say, have you ever thought of a re reality TV oh, show? I, I tell you what. I could definitely see one in this building. I have got so many characters, and I tell people, just be yourself. You, you, you don't have to act. You just be yourself. Let it, let it roll. Uh, these are just good-hearted people that work for us, givers. And I'm telling you, each one of them are a character in their own right. Yeah, I they, see. They make me laugh. I make them laugh. We kind of take jabs at each other, pick on each other a little bit. But that's all part of it. It's fun. You got to have fun in the workplace. You know, you don't have to, everybody doesn't have to be a stuffed shirt and scared to talk or, you know, meet new friends, be happy, go to lunch, do things. Um, it's camaraderie, getting along, helping the motoring public. If you don't respect that, your whole perspective is whack. Hustle fam, you know what we do around this time. If you smell something burning, it's only your desire. We are reporting and recording live from Azusa something, California. I don't know how to say it. Azusa, something like that. That's it. Here at Jen's Towing HQ. We've had an amazing time. Guys, man, I, I've enjoyed this show, Jen. Thank you for being so transparent. Thank you, sir. And just uh, bearing your soul for us, man, on this on this show, on this and episode. An easy way to remember Azusa. Uh -huh. I believe the abbreviation is everything, uh, every Azusa, everything made in Azusa, or everything made in the USA. That's what Azusa says. Everything for. made in the USA. A -Z, Azusa. I don't, a I still don't get it. A to oh, Z. A to Z. Every, a to, that's what so it it's is. So it's AZUSA. Yeah. Azusa. Everything, yeah. I, so there's, I was overthinking it. There's something there. Yeah, and there's it, definitely uh, something yeah, there. Yeah, because it, it's got a, a rhyme and a reason here. Uh, a lot of stuff right here in Azusa. I love it. I love it. All right, Jan. I think we out, man. We did Thank our you. thing. Appreciate right. you, my brother. Appreciate you, too. Let's make it happen, Hustle Fam. Let's do it. We are out. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.